to the Our World Heritage 2021 debate. 2021 debate is a year of events focused on protection, conservation and management of world heritage. We want to uncover untold stories to broaden our views on heritage practices and future perspectives. Knowledge gathered this year will be published in 2022 on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Convention. The Our World Heritage Initiative is created by individuals working on 100% voluntary capacity. We would like to point out that Our World Heritage provides an open dialogue platform that is based on voluntary work of session organizers and speakers. Our World Heritage welcomes diverse viewpoints in the spirit of collegial debate where mutual respect is afforded to all. Please note that the expressed views do not necessarily reflect the official position of Our World Heritage. We thank today's speakers for telling their stories and we thank you, the listeners, for your kind interest and questions. If you want to remain up to date on our activities, you can follow our social media. We maintain channels in multiple languages to break through the language barriers and connect to local communities. You will find all links on our website, ourworldheritage.org. Thank you for being with us today and we wish you a very fruitful event. Good day and welcome. I'm Patricia O'Donnell. Uh, I serve on the board of Our World Heritage. I'm a preservation landscape architect and planner at Heritage Landscapes. And I also chair the International Scientific Committee on Cultural Landscapes of ICOMOS and IFLA that is a co-host for this session. This is our inaugural Beyond the List session for November. And we're interested to begin this month of looking beyond the list by looking at the list itself and whether or not it is in a position today to be balanced, inclusive, and representative of the heritage across the world. Um, the World Heritage List is seen perhaps as a static entity, but it has in fact evolved considerably over the 49 years of its evolution and change um, since the 1972 um, approval and uh, putting in place of the World Heritage Convention. The earliest uh, sites favored certain areas of heritage and uh, it began to be recognized not too much later that the list was evolving in a way that was not uh, diverse and not worldwide. So this is the topic that we're going to be exploring for the next 90 or so minutes, and we appreciate your contributions. Today we have five people who are going to speak. Micah Goodcook is an urban planner focused on heritage and environmental impact assessment. And she serves as scientific assistant at the Chair for History and Theory of Urban Design at ETH Zurich and is a member of the Our World Heritage Board. Gregory DeVries is a professional landscape architect and managing partner at Heritage Landscape with degrees in anthropology and Spanish as well as landscape architecture. He is an ISCCL International Scientific Committee on Cultural Landscapes, Cultural Landscape Expert Member, and the VP for North America. Christina Cameron uh, is a retired faculty at the University of Montreal with an extensive career at Parks Canada, and particularly in World Heritage Leadership and authorship and co-authorship of publications about World Heritage Evolution and other important heritage topics. And Shika Jain is a member, of, an expert member of the International Scientific Committee on Cultural Landscapes. She's the director of DRONA and the chair of the DRONA Foundation in India and serves as an intact chapter VP and ICO Fort 
International Scientific Committee, as well as UNESCO C2C Center and the Wildlife Institute of India. So with that, we'll turn it over to Micah to give us some interesting graphics about the distribution of the list as it stands today. Thank you very much, Patricia. And I would like to congratulate you with your great award that you just received last Friday. Um, I will uh, share my screen. Um, I think you see my full screen right now. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. And I would like to show you some, um, interpret some um, numbers uh, that, I, uh, that I visualized uh, on the, some numbers on the World Heritage List. First of all, um, uh, we have today 1,150. 54 uh, properties listed, 42 are transboundary, three are delisted, 52 are in danger, uh, uh, close to 900 are cultural sites, uh, more than 200 natural sites and 40 um, cultural and natural mixed sites. Um, also, uh, these, all these uh, World Heritage um, sites are uh, governed by a total of uh, 167 uh, state parties that have signed the convention and are therefore um, yeah, eligible to um, nominate sites. Mark, um, sorry to interrupt you, but there is a problem with your share screen. We, we see mm -hmm. uh, two, two uh, gray, gray fields in the sharing. Now? Uh, again, yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'll just do it fixed. like this. Yeah, I'm not sure it can be fixed. It's. I think it's about bandwidth and connection. Uh, okay. 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 But we can see the numbers, Micah. So go ahead. Okay. I'm very sorry. Um, anyway, so if we if we visualize the total um, number of uh, sites listed per country, we see that um, well, uh, every each country sort of has at least one world heritage site. It's the very light pink. And there's uh, after that, we find different intensities. Um, as expected, um, Europe is most mm -hmm. uh, highlighted together uh, with China and uh, India. Russia has many world heritage sites as well as um, North America and, um, and um, Mexico. Um, here I have a map of uh, uh, per country again uh, that shows um, uh, the average um, nomination number of nominations per country uh, in the time that I have that they are part of the UNESCO um, World Heritage Convention. So it's a bit difficult to read maybe, but the grayish the the grayish countries, such as Russia and maybe um, the UK and Mexico, they are uh, they are average. Um, they have an average number of, of uh, sites uh, listed per year. Then in blue, there is um, they are relatively low in the number of nominations per year, and the red the reddish countries are high in number of uh, listings per year. So uh, China, for example, has 1.6 sites per year. Uh, nominated in the time that they were, um, uh, that they, after they signed the World Heritage uh, Convention. Um, there is a list, uh, um, a visualization of land area per country protected through the list in percentage. So I have uh, counted the uh, square hectares, or I've, I've counted the hectares. Um, uh, the total hectares per country uh, that is protected with the list. And then I have set it off uh, against the total hectares per country, the total areas per country. So we see that uh, Tajikistan over here and Iceland and um, Suriname, also New Zealand and Tanzania, uh, Chad have relatively high, um, sorry? No, have a very a relatively high um, 
percentage of uh, protected land area through the uh, World Heritage Convention. Then uh, over here, we have a land area protected through the list per resident, which is a different number, of course. So here we see that Suriname and um, Iceland and also Mongolia. And um, uh, here is Namibia and Algeria. They have, um, and Chad again, they, they're in also Russia relatively and Canada have relatively high um, a number of hectares to protect per resident. Translated in the in an economic um, uh, with an economic dimension, we see that uh, we see here uh, a gradient, the gradient of countries that have uh, land area protected through the list in hectares per GDP per capita. It means that the um, uh, the average wealth of people. And here you see uh, North America, again, uh, Chad and Tanzania also, and Libya and Russia. Tajikistan have very uh, relatively um, much land to protect um, compared to their economic um, uh, uh, wealth. And uh, with that, I would like to close off the listed numbers. And I think the speakers from now on will give much more depth to these numbers. Thank you very much. Thanks, Micah. That was a really good um, overview and much appreciated. I'm going to talk a bit about um, the process of moving from perhaps a less balanced toward, I mean, we're not there yet, but toward a more balanced list. So, um, I think the evolution is important to look at because the balanced and defensible direction of the list has been in place from the 1990s. And I show this over the graphic from the World Heritage Site that indicates where the sites are and you can see where the densities occur and how when you look at it at the world scale, you find um, so many sites in certain areas that you see no geography anymore, you only see dots. The um, World Heritage Convention adopted 16 November in 1972. Uh, it has a particular interest for our World Heritage in Article 5, which is specifically intended to ensure that effective and active measures are taken for the protection and conservation and presentation of cultural and natural heritage by each stage party and as appropriate for each country to adopt a general policy to give cultural and natural heritage a function in the life of communities and integrate protection into comprehensive planning programs. So this is an area at the local and state party level that perhaps is not fully robust today and is particularly of interest to our world heritage and the engagement of civil society. I've used here the Galapagos um, listed in 1978 early on in the listing process, a natural site seen here with the green on the map off the coast of uh, Ecuador. And you see the size of it is quite large. The hectares are listed here. And the criteria is seven, eight, nine, and 10, which are um, the natural, were at the time the natural criteria uh, applied in this case to this property for indigeneity and uniqueness from a scientific perspective. The uh, purpose today is to explore the World Heritage Convention 49 years of evolution toward the 50th anniversary next year, and a look at this issue of whose sites. Another 1978 listing is Mesa Verde, um, an ancient people's site in uh, the Southwest of the United States. It was listed in 1978 and as a culture site, I've put a yellow box around it because it was so hard to see. Um, it's much smaller than the natural sites. However, it is 21,000 hectare. Um, 
Note that we, while we have 194 state parties currently as signers of the World Heritage Convention, 167 of those state parties have inscribed properties. And the World Heritage Convention is the primary legal instrument for global protection of cultural natural heritage, and world heritage is a vehicle for worldwide understanding and peace. The 1990s concerned emerged about the balance and the global strategy and the ICOMOS gap report were put forward. Um, particularly at that time, it was clear that the dominant themes in religion were Christianity, that specific historical periods were being represented, elitist architecture and historic towns. Two examples are shown here. The uh, Palace and Park at Versailles, listed in 1979, and the historic center of Florence, Italy. In, at that time, in 94, 22 years after the approval and signing of the convention, there were 135 state parties and 410 properties with 304 cultural, 90 natural, and 16 mixed. So this is the background against which the global strategy and movement toward a representative and credible list began. In that 1994 World Heritage Global Strategy, the underrepresented elements that were picked out in the reporting were living and traditional cultures and mixed heritage sites. Mixed heritage sites are particularly challenging to list because they have to meet high outstanding universal value in both cultural and natural criteria. So it's a more difficult nomination. And the global strategy at that time promoted regions that were underrepresented and categories that were underrepresented. So in 94, Africa, the small island states, and states parties who had approved the convention and signed on, but had no inscriptions as yet. In addition for categories, cultural landscapes, itineraries, industrial heritage and innovation, deserts, coastal, marine, and small island sites were noted. And IUCN indicated that while there was good global coverage of natural sites, the biodiversity in terms of ecosystems was lacking grasslands, savannas, lake systems, tundra and polar systems, and cold deserts. So taking these numbers a little farther, in 1981, there were 84 listed properties, 91, 357, 2001, 721, 2011, 936. So these are the decade markers coming 10 years after, and then 20, and then 30, and then 2021, uh, 1154. So you can see that we have a, a growth and a change. The current coverage of nature sites is 303 million hectares, mixed sites 69 million hectares, and the World Heritage Center statistics doesn't measure for the cultural sites, which are more numerous, but sometimes smaller, sometimes relatively large. If we look at the numbers behind the maps that Micah showed, uh, with 194 state parties, 27 state parties have zero sites, 61 have one or two, 78 have three through 10, 15 are 11 to 20, and five have 21 to 30. These are Brazil, USA, Japan, Iran, and the Russian Federation. And five have 31 to 49, the United Kingdom, Mexico, India, France, and Spain. And three have 50 to 58, Germany, China, and Italy. And the 27 state parties with no inscribed sites are listed here and generally indicate to us that small island states, the Arab region, and parts of Africa are not represented as yet. The global distribution generally favors um, the European region, but in the case of natural properties, 
the highest listing is in the Asia Pacific region, shown here closely followed by Europe. And we have very few natural sites in the Arab region, the Latin American and Caribbean region is at the mid level as is Africa. If we look at the global distribution of natural properties. Um, no, sorry, mistype in the heading. These are green, so this is the cultural properties. Europe is the highest with 468. Asia Pacific region is next. And then you see the graph for the others. And the mixed properties are the lowest. There's 39 mixed properties, likely because of this difficulty in getting them listed and recognizing the range of um, values, both cultural and natural values and meeting the criteria and the review process to get to a mixed property. So 39 mixed properties over the past 49 years. And um, you see the distribution here. Additionally, this um, graph is available on the World Heritage website and it shows the listing by year from 1978, the first year of listing on to the present 2021. Um, actually, I think listing for the 2020 and 2021, uh, the most recent meeting. So you see at the top here in blue, the cultural and its uh, densities and spikes in the middle, the, the red for natural and the low and but fairly continuous level with a few gaps for mixed site inscriptions. So there's not an evenness of typologies going across time either. Um, this is a World Heritage Distribution snap snapshot looking at um, the world map in blank, which gives us perhaps a, a, an, a more interesting way of graphically capturing and just to show Africa and its landmass and Europe and its landmass in contrast toward this thinking about an evolution toward a balanced and defensible list. One vector that's perhaps interesting to look at is this notion in the studies in the 1990s and repeated in 2005 that um, religious diversity in 94 was lacking and that most of the sites were Christianity. So what has happened since noting this issue, there is a religious diversity increase in cultural sites testing for several religions. The Muslim sites have four, the Jewish 21, the Hindu 27, the Buddhist 39, and the Catholic is still dominant at 56, but there are other religions that are coming forward. And um, I show here a picture of the Temple of Heaven, and its listing is interesting because it indicates that it's the only temple on the planet dedicated to heaven. Um, and these lists give you a sense of the, the distribution of the Muslim sites in India, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Spain, those four, and the Buddhist, a selection of a few Buddhist sites in Afghanistan, Bangladesh, China, and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. So if we're moving toward a balanced and representative world heritage nation by nation, what is the process? The 2005 study looked at world heritage lists filling the gaps and set forth an action plan from ICOMOS and IUCN analysis that said that we needed to revise the tentative list. This is now 16 years ago in accordance with the gaps and that the preparation of new nominations should be brought forward by states parties for under or unrepresented aspects of heritage going beyond individual sites and protected areas to cover land and seascapes as appropriate to the world's regions and peoples. So we're going to delve into a few of our speakers are delving into this notion of what is the tentative list process. It's important to note that while 
the gap study and the movement toward a global strategy is a top-down process, the lists actually come forward from state parties and the state parties develop tentative lists in cycle. They're supposed to be for 10 years. And there is a deep influence on the formation of the for future list coming from these tentative lists. Tentative lists can be top-down built by government and experts. They can be bottom up arising from property stewards and civil society, and they can be integrated with local and regional desires as well as heritage scholarship and governance. And we're gonna um, explore some examples from Canada and India. The other thing that's interesting about what's happening recently on the list is indigenous sites rising and Greg DeVries is gonna focus on this a bit and I'm just showing two examples from Canada and Australia of very recent listings of indigenous properties. So uh, our World Heritage seeks to advance heritage as a platform for global equity, inclusion, justice, and peace. And we think moving beyond the list to value all heritage is the direction. And I offer this quote from Irina Bokova, um, tangible and intangible heritage are sources of social cohesion, factors of diversity and drivers of creativity and innovation and urban regeneration. We must do more to harness this power. Thank you and I'll turn it over to Greg. Hello, let me share screens here. Trying to, what can you see at the moment? We don't see your screen yet. Okay. If questions are arising from those who are attending or even other speakers, you can put those in the chat. That would be really helpful for our discussion later. Your screen share is huh. funny. Hmm. Not sure why, Greg. You've got that funny half screen thing happening. Hmm. Go to the let's next see. frame and let's see what you've got. That's better. Okay. Right. So I'd like to speak a little bit uh, about the topic of indigenous world heritage. And so looking at representation and the like, first, maybe we should speak a little bit about the definition definitions. And United Nations does not, um, or UNESCO rather, does not have a, a standard definition. And in instead chooses to go by a series of identifiers which largely have to do with self-identification. Um, indigenous people are typically seen as descendants of, of people who inhabited a country or a geographical region at a time when people of different cultures or other ethnic origins arrived. So a series of indicators include um, self-identification, historical continuity with pre-settlement, other pre-settlement societies, strong links to territories or, or uh, natural resources, distinct social, economic, and political systems that are unique to a, a place, uh, distinct language, culture, or beliefs, um, uh, often from non-dominant groups within society, uh, and resolve to maintain or reproduce ancestral environments or systems. Now, 
not all of these necessarily apply in any given case. Um, so there are 370 million indigenous people spread across 70 countries worldwide and ranging from kind of traditional views, uh, children in dugout canoes, um, older folks in the, the John Crow and Blue Mountains in Jamaica, and then also represented at COP26 with a series of Maori speakers. Indigenous heritage itself, if you just search up the term within the list, um, we're gonna look at terminology a bit. There are 74 cultural sites and 41 natural sites that are tagged with the word indigenous. Um, a total of 124 properties and mixed sites. These relate to uh, use of the term, and you can see the distribution largely within the Americas, but also spread throughout the world. Examples of cultural sites, uh, for example, Argentina um, and Brazil, and oftentimes these sites also are laden with issues of the settlement societies themselves or of power dynamics within, uh, within the cultural group. So Je Jesuit missions, the Parati in Ilha Grande in Brazil, which have to do with subjected people as well as the evolution of society sense. Natural sites, a large series of these, and oftentimes uh, there's an overlap between culture and nature. So there's the mixed site of of the, the Blue Mount, Blue and John Crow Mountains. Okay. So other considerations, there's the terminology itself, indigenous, often uh, First Nation in Canada, Aboriginal in places, traditional societies, and also endemic, especially when we're referencing not just culture, but also nature, so endemic species. But there are numbers, there's a series of issues related to the use of these terms and how they can be compared across uh, in tracking various sites. So mobility and connections to physical heritage are often uh, a topic. Look at the Garifuna people of Central America or the Métis in Canada, the Maroons throughout the Caribbean, or uh, very kind of Native American conventional understandings of Potawatomi people, but then there's the diaspora and the, the historical trajectories of, of people related to place. So let's look at how this has changed over time with the list and maybe explore some other terms too. Um, but in relation to the Potawatomi and to an example of this, just within the United States, if we look at a, a state like Oklahoma, there's 12 different language families represented within this state, but they all came largely from another location. And this larger map on the side shows the movement of people in the 19th century, largely as a result of uh, displacement and the trail of tears from settler societies. So these are all uh, considerations when, when in, looking into the term indigenous and, and how that relates to place. So this is a different map uh, showing the word traditional. So as you saw before with the word indigenous largely held in the, the dominance in the Americas, here we see Africa and especially uh, Europe and Asia, as well as the Middle East with 352 natural or cultural sites and 47 natural sites using the word traditional. If we look at endemic in terms of species typically, then this largely is shows a greater distribution, more equal distribution across the across the globe with only four cultural sites, but 109 natural sites. So some of the challenge, challenges with regards to the, the sites that are inscribed themselves or future sites are capacity for management and for nomination, um, resources in terms of uh, human capacity, as well as traditional uh, issues that, that tend to 
uh, affect indigenous people and also groups that are marginalized from larger societies at times. Um, climate change issues disproportionately affecting people whose livelihoods are tied to land, uh, oftentimes indigenous and traditional uh, lifestyle groups and poverty in general, but then also these, in, these also relate to a loss of cultural connections to place, which can affect uh, typically world heritage sites as well as management. And then there's internal factors, whereas the world heritage site process is uh, somewhat of an outside protocol for many, many groups and societies within these traditional societies or indigenous groups, there have been issues with uh, authority and decision-making uh, conflicts between the outside protocols of world heritage and internal protocols, as well as understanding outstanding universal value. Um, in this example from Pumachuan Aki in Canada, um, a nomination that I'm quite familiar with, having taken part in some efforts related to it, um, there have been uh, concerns over at the initial point of having landowners on the ground and elders understand what outstanding universal value means in relationship to other groups. Why is, why is my heritage outstanding and warrant outstanding universal value? Why wouldn't everyone else's heritage also warrant that and other issues of that sort? Some trends that we're seeing is the gradual increase in representation. However, within the tentative list, there's a hundred sites that are flagged with uh, indigenous out of the 1,726. And there's also an increased role of cultural and natural sites um, and also the importance of co-management. Oftentimes when sites are inscribed themselves, it's the criterion three and, and six that are inscribed for culture. Now there's different directions within this. Uh, that is the sites recognizing outstanding universal value of an indigenous group because of certain uh, characteristics, including uh, this recent site in Iran, which has a variety of uh, the Hauran Uramet um, traditional societies that also have religious overtones and traditional practices. But then there's also world heritage sites that recognize the management role of a group. So I guess there's, there's different directions of indigeneity in terms of world heritage. And one is within the natural sites of places like the Rio Platano, the tropical rainforest uh, heritage of the Solomon Islands, which is on the tentative list and also Pumachuanaki. Oftentimes indigenous management in, and associated values are enshrined within these natural sites while the culture is not specifically recognized within the, nom within the nomination in terms of the criterion. So to conclude, uh, there's a, an overlap of cultural and natural um, heritage that relates to indigenous people, especially since they are the stewards of the world's bio and cultural diversity. Uh, although indigenous people only account for 5% of the world's population, they effectively manage 20 to 25% of the land surface and much of the resources. Thank you. Thanks, Greg, excellent. And really um, insightful and useful details in indigeneity and, and endemicism and all of the other um, terminology that can be applied. So Christina, if you could speak to us a bit about the Canada tentative list process, that would be great. Thank you, Patricia. I'm just looking for my, my uh, PowerPoint. Here we go. There you go. Thank you. Um, now, to get it full size. Uh, so I got to go up to the top. There we go. Thank you. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. And 
Thank you, Patricia, for organizing this session and, and thank you for to the previous speakers. It, it's very stimulating. So I'm going to talk about the drop down of how do sites actually come forward to the World Heritage Committee for inscription and how they how do they get on the tentative list? Because that's a, a um, requirement before you can have a site examined. It has to be on the tentative list for at least a year. And uh, I actually have been involved in the making of two World Heritage tentative lists in Canada. The first one when I was uh, uh, an employee at Parks Canada and responsible for the exercise. And then the second time as the chairperson from outside for the 2017 list. And there are differences in how each list was composed. And I'll take you through that and show you what the sites that came out of that exercise actually looked like and then see how the outcomes look the same or look different. I hope that's useful. So the 2004 exercise was really a government process. And uh, from within, with recommendations from within the bureaucracy, the minister appointed an advisory committee because in the end, the minister has to approve the tentative list. This was the minister of environment at the time. So what uh, we did within Parks Canada, we had received, we'd had an early, early tentative list in 1981 that was really written by one person in, on, on the traditional the, uh, dinner napkin kind of thing. And uh, it was just his view of what should be on the World Heritage List. But since that time, people had been writing to Parks Canada and saying, we think this should be on the World Heritage List. So. We ended up doing a, a scientific assessment of all, it was like opening the file drawers, a scientific assessment of all of those uh, proposals uh, using the World Heritage criteria and the priorities as set by the global strategy or by the uh, gap analyses by ICMAS and ICRAM. And then we went to a national consultation, but it was not like an open consultation. It was to the deputy minister level of all the provinces and territories and to national organizations like ICOMAS Canada and so on and the indigenous organizations. And from that process, they were invited. We would make an, a presentation of what was had been in our file drawers and give them the big brick of all the analysis of that, which had been done by the way, by two people who were very familiar with World Heritage. One was Susan Buggy, who had participated in the Petit Pierre meeting to create the cultural landscapes category, and Jim Thorsell, who had done the, uh, a Canadian, who had done the um, IUCN evaluations for years and years. So we had people who knew how World Heritage worked and where the gaps were. Then we had this national consultation, and at the end of the day, we had we had invited them to send in other proposals. And at the end of the day, the ministerial advisory committee looked at 125 proposals. And uh, then, when it got down to a shorter list, we had to then go out and look for stakeholder permission, and that shortened the recommendation because some sites that had been considered, there had not been public input, civil society input, if you want, or owner steward in, input. And some people were not interested in moving forward. So at that first list had 11 sites at the end of the day. In 2017, it was a public process. And this started uh, with the, uh, in 2015, with the new prime minister of the day who wanted to, open things up and have more participation from the public. And in this case, in general, for all appointments and so on. So in this case, you had to put in an application to be a member of the minister's advisory committee with a CV and why you would be qualified to do that. The second uh, part of that was that it was a public nomination process. Basically, uh, on the website, the criteria and the World Heritage priorities were pushed, put up on the website and a document that re also required the nominator to get the stakeholder permission at the time. So that was a very different process. And then Parks Canada did a lot of research to help prepare the files for the advisory committee. And in this case, I chaired that committee. And in this case, we examined 42 nominations and came up with a list of eight. Uh, we were asked, to look at, not come forward with more than 10. So that was 
where we ended up. And just to show you that this was the application form that was up on the web. It was, you had to uh, fill out these boxes and you had to make a statement. You had to look at the operational guidelines yourself and make a statement of value. So of course it was very uneven because it was not always understood. The words of World Heritage are quite arcane and many people don't understand what they actually mean. And if you don't have experience, you might think that the old barn in the back of your property might meet those criteria. It depends on how your perspective. So that was an issue. So I won't, this is not a talk on the criteria, but just to remind ourselves that there are six criteria for name mostly for culture and four for nature. And I think we'll just move on from that. But what we were given in both cases was uh, to the ministerial advisory committees, the mandate was to recommend sites that had the best potential to be one, judged of outstanding universal value by meeting at least one of the 10 criteria. And of course, to meet the test of authenticity and or integrity, which is a requirement and to meet stringent management and legal requirements, which meant that nominators, and when they didn't fill it out, then the Parks Canada research went further into that. What, what were the management structures and what kind of legal protection was there? And to have the support of stakeholders. So this was quite a different exercise. And the committees were different. And I found it interesting to actually look at that. In the 2004 committee, there were six people four men, two women, three had natural heritage expertise, two had cultural heritage expertise, and one was had tourism expertise. There was really no diversity. And in 2017, there were seven people, four men, three women, two were natural heritage experts, three had were cultural heritage experts, and two were indigenous heritage experts. So this was a very different looking committee. And there were two Indigenous people and one visible minority. So that was much better diversity. And just to show you what it looked like, and this was, we had actually the 2017, uh, the 2004 uh, exercise went over two full years. This one in 2017, we had to do it within one year. But we met in the winter, as you can see, beside the Rideau Canal in a very cold day. And then we met in the summer. We, I think we had three meetings of three days each, something like that. And it was an enormous amount of paper to go through and debates. The debates were very, very tight and, and passionate, as you would expect. So how did it look from the 2004 list? There were 11 sites, and now seven of those have been listed on the World Heritage List. I show you the 11 sites because I think it shows the geographic Disperse, and it wasn't really done. The, the advisory committee was not asked to make sure it was geographically balanced, but in fact, it turned out to be pretty good on that front. And I won't go into a lot of detail on each of the sites, but Isonipe, which is now on the World Heritage List, is a, a, picto a pictograph and petroglyph site with uh, images of the, great, of the indigenous peoples of the Great Plains of North America. You can see it's right on the southern border with the United States. And ideally it should have had also the American side, but there was no interest from the government in doing that. Um, uh, this one, which was called at that time, Atakaki Woodland Caribou uh, is the Machawanaki, which uh, Greg has been mentioning. And I would say just to add to what Greg has said, this one was brought forward by the indigenous peoples. They present, they proposed it to Parks Canada. And it has stimulated a broad discussion about the cultural value of nature, which has been very interesting for world heritage in terms of shifting perspectives. Grand Pay was a uh, site that at the time of the tentative list was looked at as the place of the dispersal of the Acadian people by the British in the middle of the 19th century. And that's where a lot of them went to Cajun country and so on Louisiana, that whole dispersal of the Acadians. But in fact, when the research was done, the other reason for designation was very clearly the almost medieval system of draining the marshlands. And you can see the patchwork of the lands. That was a, a very important relic landscape, which was not clear to the 
Advisory Committee. Doggins is a, a uh, great fossil site. It's 10 kilometers long and 30 meters high, and it's really at the beginning of life on Earth, and there are bits of fairly short trees, 10 or 15 meters, the fossils, and tiny little lizards, and they keep falling off the fossil cliff and are collected in a museum. Another fossil site, the beginning, the beginning, earliest record of multicellular life in the ancient oceans, and it's in this part here, which actually was part of Africa at the time, and it's these tiny little creatures that are all on the rock face here. It's quite an amazing site. And Red Bay was a um, Basque whaling site that had uh, quite strong archaeological remnants on the in the bay and also several underwater, either small craft or there was one big ship. So it's been quite an important scientific site. And uh, the Rideau Canal, which was a defense canal, which still operates today. And it was built in the early uh, 19th century. And it's, it's over 200 kilometers long. What was not listed because we couldn't get the nominations put together were these four sites. Uh, the Klondike was really in part because the United States would not uh, uh, participate and it was needed to really have both sides to make it a proper connection. The other three sites, it was a question of developing the nominations, but they were then to be carried over to the 2017 exercise. Now, in the 2017 exercise, it's quite interesting how the composition is of this collection of sites. And I think it's a reflection of the different composition of the advisory committee. First of all, this uh, uh, glass sponge reefs that's an ancient reef bed off the coast of British Columbia, which is a very early vestige of what uh, reef sites did look like, and it's, it's basically fossilized now. The uh, Stein Valley cultural landscape at first blush would look as if it were a natural site, but in fact it was a very important indigenous site and it provided food and materials and, and uh, medicines, and it's also a very important sacred site for vision vision quest so that it, it has great significance to the First Nation that is there and is it, they participate very strongly in its management. Uh, Wanuskewan Heritage Park is uh, a coulee really down in the valley of the Great Plains of, of uh, North America. And there for over 6,000 years, you have quite an overlapping series of indigenous peoples who came and protected themselves from the winter and there's a small buffalo jump and a medicine wheel and so on. And it's, it's very valued by a number of different First Nations. This site in uh, Quebec, Anticosti Island was proposed for its culture as well. And th that was not retained, but what was retained was the fossil record of some catastrophic event millions of years ago, which actually is an, a record of extinction of animal life. And then, and so it's a very important scientific site to understand what happened. This site is the only kind of colonial era site on this list. And that is, it's called Hearts Content Cable Station. It's one end of an international cable that was being laid in the 1860s between North America and Ireland, the two closest points. And that was the first communications over a cable. And so in the top right corner, you can see a bit of the cable is still sticking up on the beach. So it's kind of, it has to be a joint site with Ireland and they are moving forward with that. And uh, Kajatarilik in Nunavik, it's the Eastern Arctic. And here we have an unknown, we don't know what this site was really, it's soapstone. You can see the, the holes in the top where think soapstone has been scooped out. But you have these masks and it's also, there are some surviving wooden masks in museums and it's related to the Dorset people whom, of whom we know very little. And I think this is the last, no second last on this 2017 list. And this is the Yukon ice patches in Yukon. And this one is going to be a very curious site by the time it gets to nomination because the vestiges of the glaciers will be gone, the ice patches. But each year the ice patches melt. And what is coming up is 
uh, a material record of uh, wood and feathers and skin of 7,500 years ago of the old, because it was a caribou uh, hunting site. And there's this incredible material that's coming out of it because it's been all those years under the ice and protected. So it's a very valuable site scientifically. And the last one on this 2017 list is a, a massive marine park and national park in uh, Nunavut, which is really the survival, how the, it'll, it'll really focus on the traditional, well, uh, the flora and fauna, of course, but also the traditional lifestyle of the Inuit and how they survive at the edge of the ice. And of course, this is a great record and important record of climate change. And so this one will be an interesting nomination to prepare and also to debate. So just to compare the two, the outcomes of the two exercises, I think they were both fairly participatory, but the second one was much more participatory, obviously. But the outcomes are quite similar in terms of the fact that in both cases, we had two, two fossil sites of great scientific importance. Five of them can be considered cultural landscapes um, and linked to indigenous heritage. So I think the five and the five are not unrelated. And the real difference is that in the first one, we had like the Rideau Canal and the Klondike and Red Bay and so on, Grand Pré as sort of marks of the colonial period of Canada's settlement. And in this second list, we had one which was the cable site. So I think that is an interest. I think each tentative list is an interesting um, reflection of the country and the, what the country considers to be important. But the other thing is that um, the tentative lists are they, they both of these tentative list, lists were have had a lot of participation uh, before the end of the development of the nomination. So they are really uh, a way of giving life to Article 5 of the Convention and having the participation of people in the development of what is important to them. So there'll be each tentative list is supposed to have a lifetime of about 10 years that they were 14 years between the those two, but I don't know what the 2027 tentative list will look like. I mean, it may continue this trajectory or it may go in a totally different direction. So that's very, that's what I have to say, Patricia, and thank you for your attention, everybody. Thank you, Christina. That was excellent. I think there were a few really important key points, the contrast of the two lists, um, the increase in bottom-up uh, voice, and I thought the other interesting point was the number of sites that Canada had pointed out that were potentially multinational serial nominations and required cooperation across states' parties. One of the things that's been interesting in the last 10 years in the rise in nominations, while we list 1,154, if you dig further into the list, there are a number of national and multinational serial nominations that actually lift the number of sites considerably beyond the 1,154. So the, an example I would cite is the 94 ancient beach forest that was just listed in July for um, Europe. So 94 different sites in one property listing uh, in 94 different non-contiguous geographies across Europe. So with that, um, Chika, if you could speak to us a bit about your experience in the tentative list in India and South Asia uh, harmonizing of the global strategy, that would be terrific. You have to unmute. Yeah, very good day to everyone. And thank you, Patricia, for inviting me. Uh, I hope my screen is visible. 
Um, so it's been really an interesting session uh, with the other speakers and especially uh, looking at the Canadian exercise of rev revision of tentative lists, which is something we attempted in India um, in 2012. And it was a process that carried on between 2012 to 2015. And uh, I'm just going to show you the process and how uh, we continue with the list today or even with the harmonization um, of the list. And as uh, uh, something of what was mentioned by uh, uh, Christina, that uh, if, if even the revision of tentative list that India took was actually official. It started with an advisory committee on world heritage created under the Ministry of Culture. And there were 17 members in our advisory committee. I was the member secretary for that. And uh, within that advisory committee, we took one of the tasks as revision of tentative list because it was not, uh, it was more than 10 years that any revision had been carried out. And we created a working group, a tentative list working group, which looked into this whole process. And in fact, uh, the chairperson of the tentative list working group is also, I think, in the audience here, uh, Aruna Bakchi. So uh, we looked at, of course, the global strategy. I'm not going to talk about it. Patricia has already mentioned. Uh, but I mean, what India realized as and the advisory committee uh, that, you know, we do need to look at this uh, representative balance and credible list. And while we are doing the revision for the tentative list, and of course, the ICOMAS gap analysis of 2004, which uh, mentioned the underrepresented categories, which have been earlier mentioned, vernacular architecture, or, uh, technological properties, uh, you know, the religious uh, diversity, or even cultural landscapes. And um, another gap analysis, of course, by IUCN, which was looking at the global ecoregions that would remain. Um, underrepresented, unrepresented or underrepresented. So uh, culling from the ICOMOS and IUCN gap analysis, we realized that, uh, you know, it is critical, uh, you know, the as state party, we need to review the tentative list and uh, the tentative list will have to look at different typological categories, chronological, regional and thematic frameworks and also provide uh, relevant information uh, in, uh, as per the operational guidelines. And uh, finally, we also need to harmonize the tentative list, uh, you know, like if you are looking at India to the wider region of South Asia or the uh, entire Asia uh, later on. So looking at all these gap analysis, well, the first thing that we did is we created a gap analysis for a document for the South Asia region. And uh, we realized what were the gaps within this region and how they compared with the overall gap analysis. And this document was then presented to uh, the various states across India because we went through a consultative pro process and identified these um, sites through various uh, workshops across India. So uh, it, this is a bit of summary of the gap analysis when we looked at South Asia, um, of course, I mean, India in this case across the world, we, as already mentioned in my case presentation, there was sufficient representation of World Heritage sites here, uh, but there was a balance issue, like very less natural sites compared to the others, and uh, or just one cultural landscape and no mixed properties on the World Heritage uh, list of India also, and even on the tentative list, and there were issues like the last revision, which I uh, mentioned was in 1998, so more than 10 years. Uh, the later the properties put on tentative lists were on ad hoc basis, there were less number of cultural landscape and mixed properties on this list. So looking at all this gap, we uh, you know, went through a consultative pro process. We realized that there is also a, uh, an imbalance uh, within the sub-regions within India, because India is a very diverse uh, 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 country, both geographically as well as culturally. Uh, so we realized that there was an in imbalance within uh, the region, though it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, the sites would qualify for OUV from each region, but still we wanted representation from each area before uh, the final shortlisting. Uh, so looking at this, I mean, this gap analysis for South Asia that uh, and India that we looked at it, uh, showed us that archaeological heritage and religious sites uh, were overrepresented in South Asia. And this is like taking all the countries, uh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And um, 
cultural landscapes, roots, industrial heritage, and vernacular architecture was underrepresented. And here we are using the typology as was also given in the 2004 gap analysis. And in, in a similar situation, if we looked at India at that time, it was cultural roots, symbolic properties underrepresented, and archaeological heritage and historic buildings were overrepresented. So largely a very monument-centric approach, which was uh, being carried out earlier. Um, in terms of chronological framework, there were certain periods like the Mughal period, which was overrepresented across South Asia. Um, and Stone Age or even the earlier periods were underrepresented. And a similar situation is what we saw in the chronological framework uh, representation for India, for both world heritage sites as well as tentative lists. Um, and as if we look at South Asia, the chronological framework also uh, recognized by ICOMOS, it said, and Asia, East Asia and South Asia are relatively better represented than the rest of the continent, um, which is India or Sri Lanka, largely South Asia. And certain countries have proposed sites that represent a very broad historical context. And it also mentions that even though, I mean, we could take it for Mughal sites or Islamic period sites, there may be a sufficient representation, but there may be a lot more sites that would still uh, qualify. So these were uh, some of the points also linked to the thematic framework for South Asia. Um, within groups of buildings, living historic towns were featuring more than the non-inhabited towns. And in the theme, spiritual responses, thematic framework uh, had to be supplemented by more detailed frameworks relating to specific region. Uh, some of that we saw in uh, Patricia's presentation too. So uh, we started this exercise in 2012 and completed the first round in 2015. And of course, it's, it's an ongoing process. Uh, we had six zonal uh, consultative workshops across uh, different regions of India, where we invited all uh, the states, 27 plus states and the union territories. And um, in this, we invited the state departments of culture, tourism, urban development, forests, but also NGOs and local experts. So it was open to all and the state government and local NGOs, I mean, they were, uh, you know, given um, a free um, entry or, or even permission to invite whoever, whichever experts they wanted to or local people that they wanted to. So it started as an official process, but uh, because of this consultation, there was a public voice uh, that was included. And this was carried out between uh, largely in 2012, in 2013 and 14, uh, we looked at all the selection that we had. We also carried out uh, a separate uh, workshop on natural heritage with natural heritage experts because those were less in number in our advisory committee. So another group was created and there was a separate session just for natural heritage sites uh, and mixed sites. And then uh, in 2015, when we had the final list, then we invited uh, you know, all the shortlisted uh, uh, candidates as well as all other states just for a final national workshop to explain to them what it means to be on the tentative list, how they should fill in the format. And once they've done that, what responsibility they have in future. And uh, more recently then uh, UNESCO New Delhi organized another workshop, which was on harmonization and also looking at the tentative list again in 2019. So uh, again, we had all the states from India, but we also had other countries uh, representation uh, from Bhutan, Nepal, Maldives, and Sri Lanka, where we could look at uh, the um, harmonization and, and again, underrepresented categories. This was part of the South Asia global strategy uh, that UNESCO New Delhi was working on. So the common issues that were identified in the workshop, which has been mentioned in earlier presentations also that, you know, the need to elaborate different criteria and procedures for South Asian region, because, uh, you know, a lot of people felt that we have something that, uh, you know, is not really covered in the operational guidelines or the way the criteria are mentioned or the way sites are inscribed. So uh, the, the difference between World Heritage terminology and the local perspective, uh, so South Asian perspectives such as indigenous systems of protection and management, they felt needed to be there. Uh, there was a lack of comprehension of the OUV and clarity in articulation at local level. 
Uh, there were, of course, issues of absence of appropriate legal framework for protection and management of uh, properties, uh, especially in property sites beyond the protected monuments, because there were so a lot of sites. Um, you know, India has a vast repository. Recently, we've done a listing of 100,000 uh, cultural heritage sites uh, in India. So it's there are a lot of unprotected also, which may have a potential OUV, and there is a increasing need to put them under protection. So legislation is a big issue. Uh, difficulty in management due to multiple jurisdiction of sites, multiple owners, or multiple um, organizations handling one uh, site area and management of transboundary sites due to lack of dialogue. So looking at all this, uh, we were uh, finally, after these uh, six zonal workshops, there were total 238 sites proposed uh, for tentative list. And out of these, 162 were cultural and 76 natural mixed and cultural landscape. Uh, though our concern was, of course, to enhance the mixed and cultural landscape, and, and that's what we uh, uh, advocated during the consultative workshops, but largely as the trend is the cultural sites uh, were uh, proposed more in number. We had an assessment methodology where we were looking at, uh, you know, we created a reference table for each site, looking at the outstanding universal value and the criteria, integrity and authenticity, the boundaries, management protection, and whether they are prepared to do dossier or other resources. And based on that, we created a matrix and we looked at what, you know, where these key determinants that I just mentioned, whether they were strong, moderate or weak. And in terms of preparedness, whether the site was like it was short term, medium or long term. And based on that, we created these boxes and we realized that only certain like the green ones that you see had the potential to be put on tentative list because they had a potential outstanding universal value. Whereas the others, uh, you know, there could be which, which were identified for thematic studies and could be explored more uh, to really determine whether there was a potential OUV. And uh, the rest we suggested that there should be a national list should be created for those. So finally, the resultant was, I mean, we managed to bridge some of the gaps. Initially, we had about 34 properties on the tentative list, and we finally proposed a number of 57. And we sort of, uh, you know, uh, helped like the, the ministry office and uh, my particular office was trying to help different state governments to put together the tentative list. But yet every, they were, most of them were not able to uh, send it through in the format. So finally, we just had about 42 of these 57 that were uh, submitted uh, in the revised tentative list. And among these, uh, there were 36 cultural, 21 natural mixed cultural landscapes. So, and several thematic studies were proposed to be carried out by ICOMOS India and various institutions. Um, and like I said, remaining properties we proposed for a national uh, level um, recognition. So in the revised tentative list, we could increase the natural heritage properties to 31% and uh, the mixed and cultural landscape to five and 6%, though very nominal increase, uh, yet there was you know, some effort. Uh, one of the uh, you know, good achievements as part of this process was there were some sites like the Kanchanjunga National Park, which was actually placed uh, as a natural site on the tentative list. But while we were doing this workshop uh, in the East Zone, we actually had uh, the local community, the Lepchas, who came to the workshop with a local cultural heritage expert. And they said that this site should not go as a natural site because we have a strong association with Mount, Mount Zonga, the peak, and it should also be included as a cultural site. So it was about the dossier was already prepared by the Ministry of Environment and Forest, and it was going in for a submission. But we had from the Ministry of Culture, we wrote to the Ministry of Environment saying, you know, this is a proposal that has come through. So you may need to ask the local government, Sikkim government in this case, to uh, check for it as a mixed site. So, so for that uh, process, they actually had to wait for two or three years when, you know, it was again uh, re reviewed and the cultural component was added to it. And finally, in 2016, this was the first mixed site that was inscribed. 
So this was a good example where due to a local and you know for the indigenous uh, people, their intervention actually helped in, uh, in changing this to a mixed site. Uh, because of their uh, uh, association. And in fact, this was a point that was also recognized by ICOMOS during its inscription, because the indigenous management system here is what is really of uh, great value and is, is, is actually translated into the legislation. Um, and this is one example, I think, for even across India, it's very good to uh, emulate. Uh, if we look at the final World Heritage Sites situation in 2021 now, since 2016, eight sites, uh, eight sites have been inscribed. Our first mixed cultural landscape and first transnational site, which was Corbusier's uh, uh, site in Chandigarh, the capital complex. So both uh, uh, were inscribed at the same time in 2016. So I think it's, it's the whole process between 2012 to 2015 with the advisory committee that finally showed this kind of result in 2016. And since then, we've also had two cities inscribed. Uh, this year, of course, the total number came to about 40 for India, which is quite large. And uh, in terms of the tentative list situation, we see that there are 46 sites now on India's tentative list, out of which six are cultural landscape mixed, four are roots uh, or pan-India serial nominations, and eight natural sites. So in overall balance, I mean, it, there is a definite increase uh, in the underrepresented categories. Even um, categories like uh, the industrial or modern heritage because of inscription of Corbusier's site. And on the tentative list, we also uh, had the Baha'i House of Worship. Um, so those were the kind of new sites added. And there were certain sites that we realized were on the tentative list that did not have any legislation, which were actually removed. And we uh, sort of uh, notified the local government saying we are going to remove this because you don't have any uh, protection or it doesn't qualify for outstanding universal value like Ministry of Railways had uh, uh, an Oak Grove school which we, we nobody knew why it was there on the tentative list. So it was not just adding new ones but it was also reviewing and changing and some of them were removed or some of them which did not have protection like the Mughal Gardens of Kashmir, a man-made cultural landscape, they, they had to put in legislation in place immediately. Uh, so this exercise really helped overall in, in uh, enhancing the uh, the underrepresented category and also strengthening the legislation in few places. Uh, if we look across South Asia, you know, some, some of the other countries, Afghanistan, I mean, this is the situation of World Heritage Sites today. And they have, some of them have fair balance, like in Nepal, you see two uh, natural heritage sites on the list. And Sri Lanka, of course, is largely cultural. Uh, same for Bangladesh, and especially if we look at the tentative list, there are some countries which are really very good examples. Bhutan, though it does not have any uh, inscription, but its uh, tentative list is very well balanced with four cultural and four natural sites. And it's one of the first countries in this region which has actually uh, created uh, legislation for cultural landscapes. Um, so it's, it's again, it's a small country with no site, but it has, there are lessons to learn from here. And Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, or Sri Lanka are largely, you can see still, you know, the list is not so balanced. You, the cultural landscape or mixed sites are missing here, and it's largely cultural and monumental uh, sites which exist on the list. Uh, so it was in 2019 that we had this uh, South Asia global strategy, uh, and I think UNESCO New Delhi plans to uh, carry on another session of that and uh, provide this guidance. And this is how we are look at, looking at harmonizing the list, uh, whereas the, from India's uh, 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 approach, they actually advised uh, the various states who had put their sites on the tentative list that they need to look, you know, this is no uh, guarantee for successful nomination. And this is the time you need to look at site management. And there were clear guidelines, which, which I mentioned were provided to them even when the sites were revised. And since then there have been addition on the tentative list, uh, but this goes through a process. The advisory committee is, is uh, still there. I'm a member there. 
but it's largely managed by the archaeological survey of india now and whatever sites come are, are are proposed every year because this is a big country and every state still has aspirations but we have this template that they look at and finally asi you know incorporates the advisory committee members uh, suggestions and decides whether the site is worth uh, putting up on the list or not. Of course, it's 2022 now, and I think in another year or two, it will be uh, ready for another round of revision. Uh, and that's sort of the summary of what India and South Asia status is today. Thank you. You're muted, Patricia. Very good assessment for both uh, Southeast Asia in general and for India, and then going back and forth between those to look at what the meaning of the tentative lists are. It's interesting that you noted that some countries are really embracing the global strategy, developing a more balanced future list, and others are not. Um, we have a question in the chat that says uh, how do you envision the future revision of tentative list do you believe civil society will be more and more involved in this exercise worldwide um, i think what what we at our world heritage which is a citizen civil society platform are hoping that if we hold up examples of engagement of civil society and the process of going toward a balanced and defensible approach that does in, is inclusive in how heritage is viewed, that we can help that process. Uh, as citizens and heritage professionals, we don't have necessarily a direct role in the process, but perhaps some of the other speakers would like to answer that interesting question. How do we get the um, states parties to envision the future of the tentative lists more effectively. Go ahead, Christina. I think that the process is well laid out in the operational guidelines of the committee. The the issue really is one of whether or not individual states parties are ready to open it up like that or whether they want to keep control and that that really is a decision that is made i would say country by country i, I was very uh, impressed with what uh, shika had shown about uh, the indian process and particularly the harmonization meeting of bringing in other countries and looking at how how that could be on a shared basis and because that that's a very there are places that should be harmonized and it's hard to build the transboundary nominations but i i'm i'm very hopeful for canada that it would be very hard to turn back once you've had a public application program i don't know how from now the president is set i don't know how you would turn that back but i would hope that that could happen in other countries thanks Anyone else? We have a, a interesting question here about, uh, it was put in early on, so I'm looking to find it. Um, it's about uh, balancing tourism and the character of the sites. Um, this is in part for listed sites, but we're, we're also talking about which sites to bring forward. So how can we balance the need for tourism and protecting the tangible and intangible qualities of a site and the people who will visit just contribute to deterioration? So the question of tourism focus is a really interesting one these days because with the restarting of tourism, there is a lot of discussion about balance and carrying capacity and appropriate protection and preservation. Um, and we know that while there are world heritage sites that are actually very um, under pressure from over tourism, there are also sites that get very little visitation. 
So it's not universal that a World Heritage listing gives you too many visitors. Does any other speaker have a comment on that topic, that question? Just make a note on that. Uh, it also relates to another question that was asked about um, multiple ethnicities and religious affiliations and syncretic cultures, and how do you deal with conflict? And, and speaking to both those two questions, a lot of that has to do with the quality of the management program. So management and protection is, is built in is, is critical, uh, both for the core, the core property, but then also for the buffer, the buffer zone. And so while one of the, the hopes is that World Heritage Site Management would embrace the surrounding and resident populations, both, both residents and then also the folks that live on the on the edges within the buffer areas and beyond. And by doing so and incorporating the people whose livelihoods and, and daily interactions are associated with the, the place itself, there can be management uh, strategies and also feedback loops to understand what the, what the real impact is of uh, tourism and extractive activities and other, other aspects of uh, making use of a, of a living World Heritage Site. That's great. Any other comment on that? We have a, a question here about um, the observation that World Heritage language, OUV definition and criteria and management requires, requirements can be challenging for many groups with ambitions to achieve listing. Is there a way to address that? Um, I think in this session in particular, we're trying to sort of dig into the World Heritage process and let people understand better what it is. Um, and I think that's one way to address it, but perhaps um, the other speakers have some comments on that topic. The language barrier of World Heritage. Uh, Patricia, I would say on that one that there's no easy way of ex explaining the language in the World Heritage System and that it really requires the kind of exercise that Shika went through doing all that regional consultation with people in the room and explaining how the criteria work and so on. It's, it's, um, but as Greg said earlier, there's, there is a, an issue around the concept of outstanding universal value for certainly for indigenous peoples, because there's a reluctance to, I would say, and I, I should be careful because I don't want to appropriate the indigenous voice, but my observation is that um, there is a reluctance to say, my stewardship of this land is better than your stewardship of that land. I think there's a sense that each indigenous culture is related to its land and looks after its land. So the concept of outstanding, a selective process and an out, you know, a outstanding universal value through a comparative basis is a difficult concept. It, it isn't, uh, doesn't necessarily relate. And my other observation is there has traditionally been a difference of interpretation between IUCN and ICOMAS on what is outstanding universal value in that IUCN, IUCN has always seen it as a selective process with one site standing for a larger group and understood representative to represent the group. And the ICOMAS has been more in the line of if it's representative, if one is representative, then all the others are in that same category. And it's a, it's a different way of looking at representative, which I think also confuses um, the understanding of what the intention was, which was a selective list of some properties, but not all properties that could in fact be on the World Heritage List. Thank you. That was excellent. I think another point that we haven't necessarily made is that oftentimes a World Heritage property listing or even bringing it forward on the tentative list is a comparative process to a series of other properties in the same country, state party, that um, also have similar qualities. So I know that um, national recognition 
may in some ways be more sustainable than World Heritage listing. So the Beyond the List um, discussions here in November is also about local and regional heritage and territorial heritage that can be uplifted and protected, but not necessarily listed on the World Heritage List. Micah, do you have any other questions you want to highlight? My uh, thought while listening to this, I uh, thought back of a story I heard that um, in a consultation meeting with local uh, um, society in a specific nomination trajectory, um, I heard uh, this a uh, presenter telling a very technical story about OUV and about attributes and these kind of things. And the local population did not follow and really uh, rejected the idea of becoming a World Heritage List. While as later on, there was a speaker who spoke in terms of um, local traditions and local history and these kind of, in that kind of tone. And that actually uh, uh, created much more um, um, uh, people are much more enthusiastic about the idea of becoming nominated. So I think we should take care with this, um, uh, with the terms when we talk in, um, about participation. I think it's the role of the experts to sort of like make the link and see how technically uh, the nomination works, but towards civil society, I think it's very important to keep, um, yeah, more, friendly language. So what? That's a question. Sure. Sorry, Patricia, you're muted. Are you complimenting uh, us? Uh, please, Patricia, unmute. Unmute. It's Patricia, not you. I think Patricia is completely <laughs> blocked. <laughs> I think we need, I will need to, uh, I think uh, we'll, we can go to another audience question. I see that uh, uh, there is a question uh, to Shika. The list um, in the India tentative list contains uh, 46 properties. State parties are allowed to nominate uh, one side per session. Is it exercise meaningful? Thank you. This is yeah, to Shika. I think this is a question from Dennis. I just saw. Yeah, the, the exercise is definitely useful, you know, because tentative list once, uh, as I mentioned, it becomes a tool for management, for legislation. And it's like a wish list. I mean, obviously, we it's, it'll take us 46 years, you know, to put it up there. But it's the, the locals, even when, when it gets on the tentative list, the management, uh, the stakeholders, they become very conscious. And there is, you know, another uh, level of monitoring eyes on that particular property. And even the Ministry of Culture and ESI are, you know, concerned. So I think it is a way of protecting and the being the with the legislation in place. It may take several years or it may, you know, uh, you know, take a, a lifetime or more for it to be on the inscription. Uh, but that's not uh, really what matters. I think just being on the tentative list also has certain benefits and we've seen that in case of India. That's great, thanks. I did freeze for a few minutes there, so appreciate you carrying on. Um, I, I think this has been a really uh, helpful and useful discussion to start the Beyond the List month. Uh, I know that uh, we've enjoyed uh, speaking together on this topic and certainly uh, the viewpoints expressed have been really um, broad and we hope helpful. I think the notion of coming forward for world heritage often helps people who support and advocate for a particular resource to put in place the protections that the resource needs. And, whether that be a natural, cultural, or mixed site, 
the protections and the management strategies that even going through the exercise of engaging in a discussion of building a tentative list can bring forward. But I think I'd like to close this and I'm welcome to have the speakers make a closing comment with the fact that the tentative list is where the balance and global strategy of world heritage comes from. And if the state's parties are not um, opening their tentative list process to civil society, civil society has no way in. Now, in some states parties, that may mean that civil society needs to advocate harder uh, and be more present uh, in unofficial ways in what is essentially an official process that the state party puts forward. So um, I, I would just suggest that the tentative list is where the attention should be and that the tentative list is a route toward improving protection and management of a property, whether or not it is ever listed in World Heritage. Any other closing comments? A quick one. Um, I was to say that, that I, I find, Patricia, that I totally agree with that and that it is really, I think the tentative list exercise is a big opportunity to raise awareness, not just about world heritage, but about conservation and about methodology in a sense and, and how, how these places are, why these places are important to raise awareness of their importance and also how they could be looked after. Thank you. I also had one uh, last thought for this uh, coming months, but I'm um, thinking myself a lot about. Um, there are, the World Heritage List is very much organized per state party and in terms of numbers and the very, um, uh, it, it, it centralizes, uh, it, 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 it uh, centers around the state party. But there are, of course, also like some global movements going on um, that is not solvable either on site level, on state party level, but it's really like our joint um, problems such as um, uh, climate change and the development boom that is just overall. And my sort of personal interest in this topic is is, is whether um, it, it uh, state parties can um, whether the list and uh, the system is uh, offers to be um, ambitious enough to also cover these sort of bigger problems, um, and um, and how can we sort of uh, integrate this element of these larger um, manifestations into the listing process, maybe in the categories or the operational guidelines, but the cr criteria, as I mean, operational guidelines and these kind of set this set system let's say is it still up to date can we sort of um uh yeah really make it more ambitious thanks great comment greg you had a closing comment yes to follow up on because uh statement there i think that the the tentative list process and indeed the whole world heritage process is important for its temporal aspect in that the time it takes the years that it takes from concept and description and getting people involved to the tentative list process to eventual um, the inscription if that's where it, if that's where it goes it presents uh, it's a long time and then when looking at management capacity and uh, con contingency planning and all of the other different aspects these then given this uh, this time in the history of the planet and that involves the effects of climate change and migration and technological change and all the other aspects. And so it, it's interesting how those kind of pressing concerns meet the temporal aspect as well as the management system going forward. Excellent. Chica, anything for closing? I think I already said, uh... You know, I'm total, in total agreement with what you said, you know, in terms of legislation and management, it's a very important tool. And also for awareness, just making people understand what is outstanding value and how you should shortlist. So, and conservation as mentioned by Christina, so. Thank you. 
So I'd also just mention that because we had a kind of a focused topic, we haven't talked much about climate change and any of the other really pressing issues. Um, Greg talked a bit about the diasporas and migration globally, which is huge. Whose heritage is it? And how do you engage in the new place? Um, but I, I would, I think, be remiss if I didn't mention that there are a series of platforms that have arisen over these last couple of years in case studies that are quite helpful. Uh, and you can refer to this uh, recording on YouTube if you want to dig into some of the points that were made. So those case study platforms include one that's IUCN and multiple sponsors is called Panorama. Uh, World Heritage has started one called Canopy. And um, there's really a lot of notion these days that through digitally um, mounting case studies, we can learn from each other and move forward more effectively. And I would just end with a uh, screen share here to show our um, events for the month that uh, we have two more coming up on Friday the 19th called the People's List and Beyond Southeast Asia and another one called Unsilencing the Past Documentation and Pedagogy uh, on the 24th and a new one will be posted uh, in the next couple of days for the 29th. So with that, I would sign off and thank you all for joining and really big thanks to the speakers for bringing forward this issue.